so hi guys uh, it's a great pleasure to have dr gabor sarosi from department of theoretical physics cern uh, in our qstn forum this is the 72nd uh, talk in the series and uh, he is going to talk about the butterfly effect away from maximal chaos and this is based on the work listed here uh, for last two years or so he is doing uh, work on this topic and thank you gabor for uh, accepting the invitation for giving the talk in this forum and um, we are welcoming you from india so you can start Uh, so thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, so I will talk about uh, the butterfly effect away from maximal chaos, uh, and it's based on the work with uh, Mark Meze and Chang uh, Okay, so here's the outline of the talk. Uh, there will be a, a small introduction into the quantum butterfly effect, where I will review the main topic uh, yeah, well, interest here. Mind, yes. if you don't don't mind can you go back to the previous slide once yes yeah now you can go okay thanks <laughs> so i will start with uh, a small introduction to the quantum butterfly effect and the uh, out of time ordered correlation of functions uh, that diagnose this effect uh, then I will uh, talk about a topic where you can um, study and related to other known physics, uh, this effect, which is uh, chaos and Rindler space uh, for large and conformal field theories and the uh, connection to Reggie theory. Uh, so this will be a particular instance of this general theme and another particular instance that I will talk about is uh, chaos in uh, SYK chain. Uh, which is a kind of lattice model that I will introduce. Um, and uh, in the last part of the talk, I will talk about uh, the pulse skipping phenomenon and how, uh, why is it interesting and how does it generalize away from, uh, from maximal chaos. Okay, uh, so here's a standard introduction to the butterfly effect. Uh, so what we mean by the butterfly effect in classical mechanics is uh, high sensitivity to perturbations to initial data. So the system starts from some point in phase space, it evolves in some way under time evolution. And if we have a chaotic mixing dynamics, then we expect if we make a small change here, then the system can evolve in a very different manner and end up very far away from where it could, would have without the perturbation. And uh, a kind of characterization of this is how this kind of separation grows. Uh, and in a chaotic system, uh, it typically grows exponentially. Uh, and this is characterized by Aponov exponent. Uh, so way to characterize this is to, uh, or to get this exponent is to consider the dependence uh, of the trajectory at time t on, on the initial data. So now we want to kind of turn this into a, a quantum probe. Uh, uh, and to do Gabor, this. I have a question. Yes. Uh, in uh, case of quantum side, we used to calculate the four point function, which is the square of the commutator bracket. But here yes. in the classical side, you have written a Poisson bracket. Why not the Poisson bracket square? And why not, uh, particularly in quantum side, the commutator only, not the commutator squared. Yeah, so I will be interested in the commutator square, as you can see here. Uh, so, so this is to kind of motivate uh, this, uh, this e to the lambda t, because this is a derivative like this. And just from the classical point of view, you wouldn't necessarily want to put a square because it's the same information. Oh, that, that's perfect. But I'm saying that in the quantum side, is it possible to calculate minus of the commutator is this uh, without the square without the square yeah That's yeah it. yeah it's possible but it's uh it's typically not an interesting quantity because it's a uh, some two-point function it's some spectral function actually if you do that uh and it doesn't display this growing behavior and the reason for that uh is simply because now this is not a number but an operator and if you 
uh, probe it in some state uh, in which there are lots of cancellations between matrix elements of this operator, uh, which happens in the thermal state, uh, then you miss this exponential growth. So the reason why we put a square is that because this way all matrix elements uh, will be sign definite. So because this is an anti-Hermitian operator, I put a minus. So this way all uh, matrix yeah, elements will be. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a positive operator. So, so in that way, by the expectation value, you um, you probe its magnitude, and you expect to see this this growth. Yeah, and uh, second point is like this idea was very uh, like earlier, as you have quoted by Larkin. It was proposed in the context of superconductivity. Okay. Yes. And then why suddenly for few long years it was not there in the picture and suddenly it came again. So can you tell something about that? Yeah, so it's a it's a good question. Uh, I guess uh, there's some chance in it, uh, of course, but I guess the reason why this uh, became so popular recently is because this is a kind of quantity uh, that you can calc so it's difficult to calculate in general uh, in a chaotic system where you would you would just get this type of growth uh, but in the context of holography this is a calculable quantity and is related to um, properties of horizons of uh, black holes so scattering near the horizon region. So that's something that uh, shed some light on the uh, like chaotic properties of uh, duals to holographic systems and uh, also the information problem and so on. So that made uh, this quantity kind of uh, central again, uh, or not again, but for the first time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the attention. Okay. Okay. You can. Uh, so, yes. I'm saying that you can proceed. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. So, so in general, uh, for a general quantum system, uh, we want to look at this kind of commutator square. Then, uh, and now you don't necessarily need to pick uh, coordinates and momenta. You can just pick some two operators that are. Heisenberg operators, so they evolve in time, and you want to probe them at different times and see how this commutator uh, expect square expectation value behaves. So this is a particular probe. Uh, and so what is the content in this probe? If you expand these commutators, there's two types of four-point functions that you get. Uh, so one is a kind of time-ordered four-point function, where the operators uh, can be kind of chained on a single time contour. Or a single time fold uh, in this correlator. Uh, Where is the yes. minus sign goes? The negative sign. Uh, why didn't I? Yeah, so I put a Hermitian conjugate now here. So, okay, so, so that, that's where that, you that will take the negative sign. Yeah, so uh, that's right. Yeah, so. If these are Hermitian operators, then when you take Hermitian conjugate of a commutator, it's negative. Oh, okay. of the commutator. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so there's a time ordered uh, correlator four point function and an out of time order uh, four point function. And in this case, the operators, there's a, an operator at zero sandwich between two operators at T. So this is a correlator that requires two time folds uh, in order to, uh, to obtain it from a path integral. Uh, okay, very good. Uh, and the other comment here is that uh, if we will be mostly interested in the thermal state, so we are exclusively interested in the thermal state when you take the expectation value of this quantity in the thermal state. And in that case, uh, this time ordered correlator uh, is something that equilibrates in some, uh, the, at the same time or the same rate as like a two point function. So there's some thermalization fine uh, time of the system, and past that, uh, this reaches its final value, and the final value is uh, just a kind of factorized uh, value, approximately. 
Uh, this is because of uh, cluster decomposition. So you have a contour, time contour, and then you have these pair of operators uh, separated a lot by these pair of operators at late times. Uh, so the, this chaotic growing effects that I was mentioning, the butterfly effect is encoded in this out of time order correlator. So this is this is what we we want to focus on. Uh, so let me give you another piece of intuition, which is kind of a quantum piece of intuition about how this OTOC, which is short for out of time order correlator, encodes uh, or tests the sensitivity to uh, initial data perturbations. So you can think about this OTOC as an overlap between two states. Uh, so these two states are like this. So here, this term of the double is just some purification of the thermal state. So it's not really important for this argument. Uh, but the point is that you have some thermal state. And in one state, you act with these operators in one um, particular order. And, and in the other state, you, you act with the reverse order. So that's the difference between these two states. So let's try to have a rough intuition of how these states evolve time or how do they look like. Uh, so let's start with Psi 2. In Psi 2, uh, we start at time 0 with the thermal state. So it's some homogeneous soup. Now I evolve to time t. Uh, so I evolve the state by t. And then I act with uh, some operator that creates some lump of excitation. Uh, so now I go back. Uh, when I go back in time, uh if the dynamics is very mixing then this excitation is not just running around but it kind of gets scrambled into this thermal bath so you just get a state like this and then you insert this v operator that gives you like a, another lump so this guy has some well localized excitation at time equals zero but it's only the v operator that's visible the w operator is is highly scrambled unless the theory is weakly coupled uh, let's follow the same uh, kind of uh, logic to understand uh, the Psi 1 state. So in this case, we start with a thermal state with an excitation, which is V. Then we go forward in time. This V excitation then gets scrambled. Then we add the W excitation. And then we go back in time so that the state is again at T equals 0, so that this W excitation <clears throat> gets scrambled. Uh, so this state in a chaotic system, if the time is large enough, uh, will just look like the thermal bath where both excitations have been scrambled. Uh, and of course, if it's uh, some integrable system or the time is not too large, then this V excitation can re-emerge. But in general, by changing in the future the state a little bit, this excitation does not re-emerge anymore. Uh, and this overlap essentially measures this, like how, how much this V excitation reemerges uh, once you have made this change in the future. Okay, so, so let's discuss how this quantity that we're interested in uh, changes in time in a chaotic system. So uh, typically it starts out something small, then it starts growing and then there, like everything in a thermal state, it will thermalize after a while and it will reach some equilibrium value. Uh, so there could be various time scales here. So there's a the time scale when the time order correlator or two point functions thermalize that let's call that local thermalization time. And then uh, there could be a different time scale where this quantity thermalizes, and let's call that the scrambling time. So in a generic system, these two could be the same or could be different. Uh, but we will be interested in this talk uh, in special systems or a class of systems where uh, we know that these are markedly different and there's some parameter epsilon here that controls their separation. So they are parametrically separated. In this case, uh, in between these two time scales, you have a kind of growing region, like a very marked uh, growing region, uh, where you can see this kind of exponential growth uh, from the classical intuition, and we call this a Yapunov region. By the way, yeah, the, the saturation region is related to rural resonances, so that's uh, something called rural region. Uh, okay, 
So, so this is this is what we want that there's an epsilon that separates uh, these two time scales. Okay. Uh, so as I said, in this region, you expect to have some exponential growth. And then the way this small parameter appears is that uh, in this region, this uh, correlator is still small, but, but it's growing exponentially. And then when it starts to sat saturate is when uh, this combination of time and the, the small parameter starts to become non-negligible. And in that case, you need to kind of some higher order effects in this combination. Uh, and an important uh, property of this correlation function in a very uh, large class of systems that do have this kind of separation between thermalization and scrambling is a universal bound on chaos. Uh, due to Maldes and Schenker and Stanford, uh, this is a kind of quantum bound that uh, tells you that uh, this exponent in the thermal state has to be smaller uh, than two pi over beta, smaller or equal. Hi, Gabor. One question. Yes. Yeah. So I this. Uh, hi. So did this this subleading term in epsilon? Uh, this means is it known what is the kind of t dependence of uh, the other terms higher order in epsilon? Uh, yeah. So it's uh, so, so there could be some prefactors and epsilon could have some sub exponential time dependence, but here the point is that. Uh, that uh, there's exponential dependence at leading order uh, plus some sub exponential stuff. And then there's like higher powers of this combination. So there are things like e to the t, 2t t, and e to the 3t and uh, things like this uh, that, yeah. that you typically expect. And this is this looks like a divergent series, but uh, and it, like it's something that uh, looks out of control in this region, but the claim is that if you resum it, then it leads to, to some saturation. Okay. And another thing, uh, this uh, uh, means, do you necessarily need a very large local Hilbert space to have a appreciable difference between uh, this TS and TD, or, or e even, even for say icing model, non-integrable icing model, will you also see some regime of uh, this uh, so, exponential. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so I think there are some works uh, analyzing whether it's possible to have this separation in a kinematic way. So near, I'm also going to talk about uh, this kind of butterfly cone in uh, like local systems where uh, where these are, how these effects spread in space time. Um, and if you have like largely separated operators, then there were some suggestions that the large separation could uh, uh, could act as this epsilon uh, and and reveal some some kind of exponential behavior. Uh, I am not sure whether there has been like accurate enough studies with long enough spin chains to to test this out in an Ising model or. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, but uh, if, if you don't have this, like just, yeah, so if you just take an Ising model and you don't like make some small parameter up uh, by some kinematic trick or some other way, then, then you would, will not see this. Uh, and that's kind of confirmed. Yeah, yeah it's just like, it, it, will, it will have some growth, but because it saturates already at this time scale, basically you, like there's no way to isolate some, uh, some quantity like this. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so so let's move on to discuss uh, what happens. Uh, so so this discussion uh, I didn't even really assume, apart from some giving some intuition that these operators are local. Uh, they are simple operators in some sense but now let's move on to the case when when we know that they are local operators uh, in systems with local interactions in this case this uh, quantity this commutator square also has a uh, has a space argument so it's something that is a function of uh, space time and uh, we can ask like what's the structure of this and one thing that we immediately expect is that uh, these effects 
of the that the operator are not spreading infinitely or like the growth of the operator is not infinitely fast uh, so that there's some region where this growth hasn't spread yet uh, yeah so so probably I have should have started out with this but uh, one extra piece of intuition here is that uh, this quantity uh, now kind of tests the footprint of the Heisenberg operator so how, how it grows uh, under time evolution so you could imagine that I put this V operator here and then it grows under time evolution and I test whether it has already spread to some location by moving around this W operator and checking whether it commutes with it. Uh, so, so in this sense, it's uh, it's some coarse measure of the size of this Heisenberg evolved operator. Uh, so we expect this to be zero. Uh, in some region uh, outside where the operator has spread because the spreading is not instantaneous and if the theory that we're looking at is has some kind of light structure or uh, some micro causality then uh, we know that it just must be zero outside of the light cone of the theory uh, but even if there's a light cone, uh, it could be that inside the light cone, this quantity doesn't start growing exponentially right away. Uh, and the region uh, where uh, growth is exponential, we call it the butterfly cone. And so it might be like a, a smaller region. Uh, okay, so, so what we expect in such systems with this uh, scale separation is that this, this is indeed a cone. Uh, and then Inside the cone, there is some large growing region where you display exponentially growth, exponential growth, and then you reach some some region of saturation. Okay, so so how, how do you characterize this? So one very useful way of characterizing this was introduced by uh, these people uh, is to kind of uh, consider a sort of scaling ansatz uh, in which case there's a an exponential growth in time, but the rate of the growth, the exponent, depends also on space. And what it actually depends on is, is an angle that you take inside this cone. Uh, so there is you, you can take some velocity and then you, you can move along a kind of array like this. And a long array like this, the exponential growth uh, can have some rate. And if I take a different velocity with a different uh, ray uh, here, then, then this rate will be different. Uh, so here's a function now, and we call this function a velocity dependent yet no exponent. So this is a kind of ansatz that is working for, for many systems. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so, so one important point here is that instead of a number characterizing this butterfly effect, now we have a function that characterizes this, this butterfly effect, and it's a function of uh, one variable, which is, which is the velocity. Uh, so some basic properties of this function is that, uh, of course, when, when we take this ray to go very close to the vertical axis, then we just uh, recover the ordinary Yapunov exponent. Uh, so at zero velocity, this function agrees with the ordinary Yapunov exponent. And then you can define the edge of this butterfly cone or the edge of the growing region uh, simply by asking where this function becomes zero. Uh, so that's where there's no longer exponential growth. So this defines the butterfly speed. Okay, so there is a, a kind of generalization of the chaos bound for this case, uh, for this function instead of the number. Uh, and there's a kind of pointwise. Sorry to ask. Yes. And so, so did this the saturation region is also in a, in the shape of a cone. Uh, yes. So. A priori, this is not necessarily obvious, but in uh, like it's a kind of consequence of uh, this bound that it cannot be faster saturating than a cone. Yeah. Uh, but in general, it's just going to be a cone. So what will uh, actually happen that it's a cone uh, and that large uh, values. So so it. it can have like a smoothed out tip, but it la at large values, its slope is the same as the, the outer cone. So it's the same butterfly speed. 
<clears throat> Thanks. Yeah. So on this exponent, uh, now this is a function, uh, and there's a point-wise bound on it uh, that looks like this. It's a kind of linear improvement compared to the Maldasana Schenker Stanford bound uh, when the velocity is non-zero. Um, and this is kind of a typical il illustration of what you would see. Uh, is that you would have uh, in some generic chaotic system uh, some velocity dependent exponent describing this kind of growth profile. Uh, here's the butterfly speed where it becomes zero. And then the way this bound looks like is just you draw a straight line between the maximally Apunov exponent of uh, Madesana Schenker and Stanford and, and the butterfly speed. Yeah, so here this is the, the MSS bound. Uh, and one particular phenomenon that is very important uh, for this talk, uh, and I want to draw your attention to, is that it's possible. So, so how would a maximally chaotic system look like that we normally call maximally chaotic? It would be the black line sitting everywhere on top of the orange bound. But it's possible to have systems which are not maximally chaotic, uh, but they have some critical velocity inside the butterfly cone so that above it, uh, they saturate this type of bound. So they display maximal chaos uh, at the edge of this butterfly cone, but not, not in the middle. OK, uh, so this is what I just said. So there is a possible new scale, V star, that's a pro the property of the system and uh, characterizes a certain properties of the system. Uh, okay, so, so let me give you um, the most standard example. Uh, it's uh, essentially ADS CFT. So as I mentioned, uh, one like like when these uh, out of time ordered correlators uh, became uh, popular uh, in recent times is when uh, it was realized that you can calculate them in the context, context of ADS CFT. And this is work by Schenker and Stanford and uh, later by many other people. Uh, and this is some calculation that is involves shock waves, and essentially uh, scattering uh, on shock waves near black hole horizons. Uh, and you get this OTOC uh, and it displays a kind of behavior like this. So there's some exponential growth and there's some spatial profile that looks like a, like a traveling wave. Uh, and from this, uh, essentially the, the Aponov exponent, the velocity dependent the Aponov exponent that you get is just you put x equals vt here uh, and you read the exponent and it, it's just this linear uh, function that I showed you on the previous slide as, uh, as the universal bound. Uh, okay, so so what happens uh, when you add stringy corrections? Uh, so in ADS CFT, it's uh, known again from the work of Schenker and Stanford that uh, stringy corrections uh, or well sheet corrections to the scattering they they lower the Aponov exponent, so they are like finite coupling corrections away from infinite coupling in the dual CFT, uh, and you have some small deviation from maximal chaos. Uh, so what happens for this velocity dependent Yapunov exponent? So the way it looks like is that you will have this kind of uh, quadratic uh, lowering of uh, of the top of uh, of this curve. So there will be some parabola here below some V star and above the V star it's still linear. So you get some some picture like this. So it goes down a little bit. And it becomes quadratic and then uh, it crosses over to linear again. So this is what you get from holography. And the way this V star looks is uh, is just controlled by the ratio of the string scale to the ADS scale. Okay, uh, so quick summary of this uh, introductory part is that uh, this velocity that then, then the Apunov exponent, sorry, uh, is a useful quantity to characterize the space-time structure of this uh, OTOC or this commutator squared. Uh, and there's some extra fine structure in here besides just uh, the, the expectation that there's a butterfly cone. Uh, and the extra structure is that you can have a kind of 
region here near the edge of the cone where you have a maximal growth and then small cone inside where the growth is, is non-maximal. Okay. And, then, and in, in general, there can be more than one critical, like the, this curve can touch in disconnected regions? Or... Uh, we, we, we believe it cannot. Uh, there's no example where it would do that, uh, but uh, it's um, yeah. So, so I will say a bit more about this, but uh, I think it's a very reasonable con con conjecture uh, that this black curve, this lambda v, is a concave curve always, mm -hmm. and in that case, it's not uh, it's not possible for it to to touch multiple times. Uh, okay, so so one particular work, couple example is is Rindler chaos in large and CFTs. Uh, so here now uh, we want to consider again a four point function, but this is not a thermal four point function now, but a vacuum four point function. Uh, and the configuration uh, that we want to look at is is this in the vacuum. So you have two operators that you just fix their positions. Uh, on the t equals zero uh, time slice, and then the other operators you boost in this way. So on the right you're boosting towards the future, and uh, on the left you're boosting towards the past. Uh, so the operator approaches the light cone. Okay. So what what does this setup have to do with uh, with thermal out of time or that correlator? So it doesn't look like uh, it would have anything to do with it, but in fact, uh, if you pick Rindler coordinates uh, in this flat space, uh, then it becomes an OTOC. And the way this works is that, uh, yeah, so you can pick these Rindler coordinates uh, uh, and then you get Rindler space essentially. And Rindler space is thermal uh, simply because you have this Sinch and Kosh here. Uh, and this is Rindler time, this capital T here, and it has an imaginary periodicity. So it has a temperature two pi. Uh, and an important point here is that, uh, like, this is a funny way of writing Rindler space, but I intentionally pulled out a well factor here because we're in a CFT. Uh, yeah, so this is what I said. Uh, it's periodic. Uh, and because we're in a CFT, we can drop this well factor. Uh, it just cancels in this correlator if you normalize it properly. So you can forget about it, and then you have a really uh, a space that has a factorized time. Uh, that is thermal, uh, and the spatial manifold is just the minus one dimensional hyperbolic space. So this is uh, essentially uh, thermal OTOCs in hyperbolic space in the special case where the curvature radius of the space is equal to, to the temperature. Um, okay, so you get this kind of OTOC. Uh, and one comment here is that uh, you get this OTOC, uh, which is indeed out of time order. Uh, and this is just coming from uh, the fact that you had time order correlated in flat space, and this Rindler time flows in opposite directions on in the two Rindler wedges. OK, uh, another comment is that in the special case of two space-time dimensions, this hyperbolic space is just uh, the line. Uh, so it's really just ordinary thermal physics. So there's no, in two dimensions, this discussion is general. Uh, okay. Uh, so now we want to extract this velocity dependent Yapunov exponent in this space. Uh, so what we want to do is kind of scale the separation of the operators with time, but now we don't have a flat uh, spatial manifold. So, so the way we do this is just to look at the spatial geodesic distance uh, between the operators, and that's what we want to scale with, with the time. So we scale it linearly with some velocity, uh, and this row is, is this geodesic distance. OK. Uh, so now when you translate this back to the flat space case, you have this kind of boost limit, uh, as I have uh, shown on the first uh, slide of this uh, subtopic. And this is a well-studied limit in, uh, in CFTs. It's, uh, it's a Reggie limit. Uh, it's not exactly the usual Reggie limit, but it's, uh, 
it's uh, very strongly related to that. Uh, so this has been studied by many people. Uh, and uh, there is a technology of uh, kind of resumming uh, the OP in this limit. Uh, and what you get is a kind of integral over complex dimensions. Uh, so this is coming from uh, some resumming, some contour deformation manipulations. Um, so you get some single integral over uh, over this complex dimension. So this new is, uh, is this type of parameterization of the conformal dimension. Uh, and there's this G function that contains data from the OP plus some kinematics. Uh, but the protagonist of, uh, of this formula of this story, because here you have this T in the exponential is, uh, is this function J of nu, uh, which is an analytically continued spin at this kind of complex dimension. Uh, and this is called the uh, leading conformal Reggie trajectory. Uh, so the way uh, you get this, so, so this is some illustration of how it looks like at different couplings. Uh, and this is uh, when, you, when you look for physical operators for real scaling dimensions, there are some operators uh, sitting on this trajectory. And those are the ones uh, that are the closest of being conserved currents uh, in the given theory. So that's why uh, the name leading energy trajectory. So they have minimal twist. Uh, and then this would give you just some discrete regi trajectory, but it turns out that there's a there's a canonical analytic continuation of this uh, of this discrete uh, point curve into a continuous curve that is a function of complex dimension. Okay, so this is how it looks like uh, zero coupling. You have a kind of a saturation of a unitarity bound, and then as you increase the coupling, it gets flatter and flatter, and uh, it becomes uh, totally flat at infinite coupling. Uh, okay, so this is how the, the OTOC is given now. And for large T, uh, the reason why this is the central pay player is that for large T, you can evaluate this integral by saddle point. Uh, so if the velocity is zero, so here's the velocity, then you really just only have this first part. And then you see that the exponent is just uh, the value of this trajectory at zero minus one. So the reason the saddle is there is that because of uh, shadow symmetry, uh, so it's from conformal representation theory, it follows that this curve must have a, a minimum in this uh, real dimension direction uh, at this particular value. Okay, where, where this new is zero. Uh, so you get this Yapun of exponent that is related to, to where this curve crosses uh, the vertical axis. So that's the intercept. So when you have non-zero velocity, then, then you have this extra V term and there's, there's a new here. So you add the linear term, which kind of tilts, tilts this uh, curve here. And then, then you get the legend uh, transform of this function, essentially. Uh, Okay, so this is not the total story. So this would just say that uh, this velocity dependent exponent is just the Legend transform of, uh, of this tragic trajectory, which is uh, true for small velocities, but now you can also have a critical velocity. And where is this critical velocity is coming from? It's coming from this function G, which has a kind of kinematical factor in it of this form. Uh, and this thing has a pole uh, when J equals two. Uh, so at spin two, uh, which is like one spin two operator, like the spin two operator on the leading rigid trajectory is, we know what it is, it's the stress energy tensor, uh, and it's corresponding to this value of nu. Okay, so essentially what happens is that uh, as you increase V, uh, like there's a contour integral along real nu here, uh, and you, you wanna go through the saddle, in a steepest descent contour, and the saddle moves upwards in the imaginary axis, and eventually it crosses this pole here. In that case, you need to, to pick up the contribution of the pole when you do the, the steepest descent analysis. Uh, and the contribution of the pole is bigger than the contribution of the saddle. So in that case, the, the leading contribution comes from the pole. Uh, and since 
it's at the location of the stress tensor, it's giving you a, a Yapunov exponent one, essentially. Okay, so there will be a critical velocity when the saddle and the pole coincides, and that critical velocity is just the slope of this Regi trajectory at the location of the stress energy tensor. So this is how the exponent looks like. Uh, there's a linear exponent uh, saturating uh, chaos bound uh, above this critical velocity, and uh, it's a Legend transform of J below it. Okay, so here's the picture again. Uh, and from this uh, formula, you can also read that the butterfly speed here is uh, one over d minus one whenever this critical velocity exists. And so this was found before by Permutter, uh, but uh, concavity of this curve uh, would imply that uh, this butterfly speed is uh, is smaller than uh, this value in generic cases where uh, maybe there's no critical velocity uh, or in the case when it's bigger than the this butterfly speed. Uh, so one comment here related to Deep Tarka's previous question is that uh, here, because there's a Legend transform relation, it's clear that the uh, concavity of this lambda is uh, related to convexity of, of this Regi trajectory. And uh, this leading Regi trajectory uh, is always convex. For the true leading Regi trajectory, there's a proof uh, in is CFT. Is this the Nachtman theorem? Is this, is this the Nachtman theorem? Uh, this uh, theorem or, uh, it's the, probably related to that book. The, yeah, go on. The, the, it, I, I, I think it is a statement about the leading digit trajectory. The, but I think it is uh, in the uh, twist and in the um, dimension space that uh, there is a concave. I see. Is it, is, is it, is it some like, uh, yes, yeah, so I. I uh, I think it's uh, not a very old result in the uh, in conformal regi theory, but there yeah, this is like only... just following like regular regi theory. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. so yeah, in in that case, there should be some analog. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, one extra caveat that I, I just want to mention here be, before we go on is that uh, so so while this is a theorem for the exact leading regi trajectory here, the, this guy that appears here is like a large n regi trajectory which is not exactly the same as the exact one uh, and i'm not sure that there's a proof uh, of that being uh, always convex but uh, i think it's a reasonable expectation uh, so but in this uh, context this is uh, like the, the main argument why you expect uh, this guy to be a concave function <clears throat> but in general, there can be some series of poles, and as you increase the velocity, you will pick up more. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, essentially, essentially, they will always be like, yeah, uh, I will actually not show examples of that, but yeah, so there are examples of cases where we really know like how these poles work, and, and the, the way it works is that the only guy that can give you a, a positive contribution is, is the first pole, and the higher poles are always activating. So they always need to touch, touch this bound. That's the way their contribution work. Uh, and they are activating at, uh, no, sorry. So they need to touch this curve, the saddle curve. Yeah. And so the saddle curve would like lean down here a little bit more. So there will be some something else, another line that will, will go like this. But when they touch it, uh, the, the value is already negative. So it's not contributing to to the chaos growth because it's already just giving these, some these are these are some holographic examples or, uh, um, are it's more like uh, syk and uh, and maybe this kind of uh, reggie story where where we can have this completely under control yeah I'm not sure whether the the string is scattering case has these. Uh, that might also like yeah maybe there's the appearing holography, but I don't uh, I don't want to say because uh, yeah right now I, I don't remember. Hmm. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay. 
Okay, so so there's a. Okay, so 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 we have related this uh, critical velocity to the slope of this trajectory, and then you might think that okay, there is this Reggie trajectory, and I told you that there's some existence results and we know some properties, but okay, uh, can you ever calculate this? And it, it turns out that this is actually something that people in integrability can calculate. In theory, it's like uh, n equals for super young mirrors, the large n limit. There's also other results in, in another integrable theory, um, like when there's some spin chain description uh, and so on. Uh, and this quantity is like remarkably simple, this slope quantity. Uh, and it has been calculated by uh, Basso and uh, there was some further work uh, or proving like a conjecture uh, of Basso by Gromov. Uh, and the way it looks like is that it's given by uh, some ratio of, uh, of best cell functions. Uh, so this is some modified best cell function and lambda here is just the Toft coupling. Of, uh, of n equals for super young mirrors. Yes. Uh, so this is a very simple formula and you can just plot how this uh, critical velocity depends on the on the coupling, Toft coupling of the theory. So at weak coupling, it goes to one. So it approaches the speed of light and then it decays. And when, so this is now a plot in terms of the inverse coupling. So you increase the coupling further, it goes down to zero and the theory becomes uh, maximally chaotic at uh, at infinite coupling, which is what we know from holography. <clears throat> okay, and, and now you can ask uh, when do you have this region of maximal chaos near the, the butterfly edge? So for this, you need uh, V star to be smaller than this stress tensor butterfly speed, which is which was one over D minus one. So in four dimensions, uh, it's just one third. And you can just solve numerically this best, like this, for, where this best cell function formula reaches uh, one over three. And what you find is that uh, you have this region here when the top coupling is larger than this particular value, uh, 37.7. Um, so, this is a kind of example where, uh, as you tune the coupling of the theory at weak coupling, you don't see this uh, saturation of the chaos bound. Uh, so this is how the curve roughly looks like, uh, and that stronger coupling, you you do see this saturation, and uh, you have this kind of uh, curve. Okay, so so let me mention uh, that uh, um, in this Rindler chaos context, uh, if you, we assume this convexity of the Regi trajectory, we can also just put some constraint on uh, on chaos data. Uh, so in this case, V star. So remember that uh, V star was the slope at the stress energy tensor. So now we want to kind of play the following trick because we know, you know, that uh, this is the slope at the stress energy tensor. We know like where it touches, where this line, we, we know the slope of this line and where it touches this curve, like the rigid trajectory. So, so one can just uh, know for sure that where this, curve uh, like that it runs below the rigid trajectory. So you can get some inequalities uh, when comparing to some marked points on the rigid trajectory. So let's focus on this case. Uh, when we look at uh, the intercept, so in that case, this guy here is just related to the Yapuno exponent. Um, so uh, in this case, you get a lower bound on V star. And it looks like this in terms of the exponent. Uh, this also implies that in order to, to have this region of maximal chaos, so V star smaller than VB, then the Yapunov exponent needs to be bigger than this dimension dependent value. So this is uh, lower, this lower bound is trivial and D equals two, but in higher dimensions, it's, uh, it's a non-trivial. Um, lower bound, so it means that you have this phenomenon as I showed you on the previous slide in n equals four, that at weak coupling, you must not have this chaos saturation near the butterfly edge, and then there's some critical coupling above which you do have it. So it's a generic phenomenon. Um, and you can also have an upper bound by just like picking a higher spin operator here on the trajectory and making this comparison here. 
So in this case, the kind of upper bound that you're getting uh, looks like this. So, so here, this is just the spin of the higher spin operator and this gamma is the anomalous dimension. So it's something positive. Uh, and uh, I just want to highlight that uh, in two dimensional case, where this is a generic discussion, not just linear chaos, it's uh, enough to have a single non-conserved uh, higher spin operator on this trajectory. So with gamma positive, strictly positive, uh, so that you have this region of uh, maximal chaos near the butterfly edge. And this is because uh, this ratio is always smaller than one. If gamma is positive, it's strictly smaller than one. And in one dimension, the butterfly speed is one. Uh, so that when this V star has to be strictly smaller than one, you will have like uh, some, some gap. Uh, Okay, so, so to summarize this part, uh, Rindler space provides a nice tractable example of thermal out of time order correlators. Uh, and the, this velocity dependent exponent is related to, to the leading rigid trajectory and the Aponov exponent to the intercept of this trajectory. And uh, the critical velocity is related to the slope of this trajectory at the stress energy tensor. And then uh, there are a bunch of exact results that you can get on this chaos data. Uh, so here, this is just borrowed from, from, uh, from integrability. Uh, so for example, in N equals uh, for super young mills, uh, th these are non-exact functions of the coupling. Uh, and the last slide was about the general, like, like just showing the general properties of the rigid trajectory constraint uh, chaos data. Okay, uh, so let me move on to the third part, uh, which is now a different example, very different example. It's more like a condensed matter spirit example, uh, which is some lattice model, uh, the SYK chain. Okay, so, so let me just briefly describe to you uh, what kind of model it is, and then I will tell you about it, what kind of properties we have found in this model. So the model, uh, the dynamical variables are Majorana fermions. So there are some sites, like some lattice. So X tells you like which lattice site you're picking. And these Majorana fermions satisfy these uh, anti-commutation relations. And uh, you make kind of large atoms of them. So at each site, you put an atom of several Majorana fermions and Majorana fermions. Uh, and then you write a Hamiltonian that uh, that uh, kind of encapsulates this structure. So this Hamiltonian was written and studied by Gu, Key, and Stanford uh, first. Uh, okay, so it looks very complicated, but the but the point is that there is there's some term that uh, involves a single X, uh, so that gives you kind of all to all interactions between these fermions inside a single atom, and then there's another term that involves X and X plus one that gives you these kind of nearest neighbor interactions. So all fermions interact to all fermions if they're nearest neighbors, but there's no longer range interactions. So it's only nearest neighbor. Uh, OK, so another property of this model that makes it uh, nice and solvable is that these, uh, these j's, which encode the interaction strengths of these O2L couplings, and these j primes, we, we choose them randomly uh, from a Gaussian uh, ensemble. Uh, so they are Gaussian random variables. Uh, it needs to be scaled with n in some particular way so that it has a nice large n limit, where n is like how many fermions are in a single atom. Uh, and there are two uh, dimensionless couplings. Uh, that describe this model. So one is uh, kind of the total magnitude in units of the temperature of these two couplings. And the other is the, the ratio of the inter-site coupling compared to the total coupling. Uh, so this guy we will call gamma. And here for this guy, there is uh, some complicated function that I'm introducing that just comes out naturally. Uh, so it will be parameterized by some W here. And this W goes between zero and one. Same, same as for gamma. So you can see if I send W to zero, then this combination is zero. If I send it to one, then it goes to infinity because of the cos pi over two. Uh, okay, so as I said, this is a solvable model in 
the large chain limit. Uh, and there's some even better handle on it uh, to answer more interesting questions uh, if you also take a large Q limit. So you first take a large N limit and then you take a large Q limit. So, so what is this little Q? Little Q is like how many fermions are grouped here in the interaction. So how many legs are there here from one uh, guy to the other, to the others. Uh, Okay, so this is the limit that we, we will be interested in. And let me just give you like a quick intuition of like uh, how this model is really solvable. So, so essentially what, what is happening, so, so why some interacting model like this becomes solvable. So what is happening is similar to like a Toft type large and limit, but it's a different large and limit uh, that you take. And there's some subset of diagrams that dominate, uh, Feynman diagrams that dominate correlation functions. Uh, so for the two-point function, which the exact two-point function would be some thick line like this, uh, and the type of diagrams that, uh, that dominate in the larger limit are these iterated Mellon diagrams. So this is a single Mellon diagram, and then you can iterate this. And because of this structure, you can write, uh, you can kind of sum these and write a kind of schwinger dyson equation. So this is an equation for the thick line. Uh, this beginning and the, this end. Uh, so this is still complicated to solve for the thick line for the exact propagator, uh, but it's much cheaper problem than exact diagonalization, and uh, it's actually easy to solve in the large Q limit. Okay, uh, so for the four-point function that is interesting for the OTOC, uh, it turns out that in the large limit, you're just summing these ladder diagrams. Uh, so there's one ladder, two ladder, and so on. Uh, so this is again a geometric series, so you can kind of sum it. Uh, and there's a ladder kernel that, uh, that you need to study in order to evaluate this, uh, which is this object appearing here and here. Uh, it depends on four variables. Okay. Uh, so what does the large Q limit buy us? So this is some, some horrible integral kernel in general, but uh, when you have large Q, which means that you have uh, lots of little legs connecting here, then the, the nice thing that happens is that this becomes a, a local uh, differential operator with some potential here, uh, it has some particular form. So that uh, finding the four point function reduces to solving partial differential equations. Uh, which is still a hard problem, but it, it turns out that uh, for, for our purposes, we can extract the type of results that we want. Uh, okay, so, so let me tell you how the velocity dependent Yapunov exponent works in this model. So, okay, I, I showed you like how I, you can calculate the four point function and then you can turn the grind and like get the OTO, like the properties of the OTOC that you need, which is uh, the growing piece. Uh, and the velocity dependent Yapunov exponent. And as I told you, there are two couplings. There is an intersite coupling and there's a, there's a total coupling strength parameterized in a way that it runs between zero and one, both of them. So you will have two regions. There will be a region, a white region here where there's no V star uh, and a blue region when there's a V star. Uh, and up here at W equals one, it's just, uh, completely saturated maximum chaos, uh, what you find. OK, yeah, so this was the bound. OK, so, so quick recap. Uh, you have this uh, SYK chain. Uh, it has an analytically solvable limit, large and large Q, and it interpolates between uh, weakly coupled theory and uh, maximally chaotic theory. Uh, so there is like a total interpolation. Uh, and you can calculate this uh, exponent uh, exactly as function of the coupling, and there are two phases in the same way as uh, as we have seen in edge theory. But this is like a very different model. There's no like Lorentz symmetry. And it's like a real term of physics. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, yeah, if I remember, I have basically unlimited time, so I, I think I can just go on into this third. Uh, yeah, you can go. You can go. Third part, right? Yeah. So, uh, so one, one question, Gabor. Uh, this uh, this yeah. is 
still numerical or uh, is it is it analytical this uh, this, this is analytical yeah so I, I didn't want to actually yes. like show this formula as here uh, okay yeah so it doesn't uh, so so I put it yeah. here and then I decided that this is just like oh. distracting but it's like actually elementary functions essentially what you get uh, so this is the the saddle part so so there's you know like there's a saturation part and then there's some butterfly speed in it there's some critical velocity and then there's some function for for the the saddle and the two couplings are the gamma and the w uh, yeah so it's uh, it's elementary functions basically that you get uh, okay uh so so poll skipping uh what so first i'm going to tell you what poll skipping is uh why, why is it interesting for us and then then i will will go to to talk about some new results about poll skipping uh so so poll skipping is uh, concerning a different quantity now so now we're for a moment forgetting about OTOC and we, we look at a, a simpler quantity, which is an energy density two point function, a retarded energy density two point function in the frequency domain. Uh, so, so this is a much simpler quantity, uh, it's still not known in, in generic systems, but uh, we have some handle on it from uh, hydrodynamics. Uh, and for example, we know that uh, because it's some conserved current response function. Uh, and one thing that we know is that uh, at uh, long wavelengths or uh, small frequency and small momentum, that this has a hydrodynamic pause. Uh, so these are the type of pause where, which have dispersion relations so that the frequency goes to zero when you send the momentum to zero. So there are two types of possibilities. Uh, there is a kind of a sound pole where you have linear dispersion relation and uh, there's energy diffusion where this pole is imaginary and it has a quadratic dispersion relation. Okay. Uh, so now this phenomenon of pole skipping that has a uh, kind of found in the context of ADS-CFT where you can calculate uh, such thermal two-point functions. Uh, is that uh, the residue on this pole line, where you follow this pole line out of uh, this hydro regime, this small p regime, so you follow it out, uh, it, it will cross a special point and the, the pole line will cross this special point and the residue will be skipped. And the special point is characterized by the point of exponent and the butterfly speed. So it's some imaginary frequency and imaginary momentum. Okay. So this has been confirmed in many holographic examples and was first uh, found by these people. Uh, okay, so an important comment here that uh, in all these holographic examples, this Lyapunov exponent, what it means is just it means 2 pi over beta. Uh, because all of these uh, cases are maximally chaotic, but the butterfly speed is something that changes from theory to theory. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is this is the kind of ads CFT observation, uh, which seems to kind of test some OTOC data in a, in a thermal two-point function. So how, how can this be? And there's a proposed explanation by Blake, Lee, and Liu. Uh, and the explanation is kind of that uh, this growth in the four function is, is coming from exchanging between the pairs of operators uh, a hydrodynamic fluid field. Uh, called sigma here, and this the contribution of this exchange is, is essentially this exponential growth. And the way this exponential growth then comes about is that this sigma propagator between these two points in frequency space should have a pole at, at this particular imaginary point so that you get this kind of growing contribution. Uh, <clears throat> and you also get like from, from the space part, spatial part, you also get this kind of wave. Okay, uh, so then why do you have pole skipping? You have pole skipping because uh, in the energy energy correlator, you should, should not have this exponential growth. So that would signal some weird instability. Uh, 
and the way that this can so 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 this is could appear a problem because since this is a, a kind of a hydrodynamic field it's it's just some functional of the fl this fluid field in in the hydro regime uh, so so it would involve this propagator that has the poles uh, but it shouldn't have this exponential growth so so the way it would have to be a functional of this uh, propagator is that it, the pole should be skipped the pole should be absent so this is this is a kind of explanation for like a very uh, sketchy explanation uh, of this paper uh, so so let me show you like a very concrete example so that this is not just uh, words uh, so it's uh, in the context of 2d cfts where um, ha and rosali uh, have found that basically the way you should think about this fluid field is that it's a kind of conformal transformation, like Virazoro conformal transformation, a small one. And it has uh, some geometric action, uh, and for small transformations, it, it looks like this. So there's some left moving and right moving guy. Uh, and this action indeed gives you a, a propagator like this that has uh, has these poles. So, so it has a pole at the uh, Omega equals minus i, p equals i. So when you close both omega and p contours, you get a kind of growing contribution like this. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, here you know how the stress energy is generated. It's just generated from essentially Schwarzian derivatives. So for small uh, uh, small conformal transformations, it has some form like this. Uh, so it's indeed a local function of the hydro field. So if you act two times with this differential operator and this propagator, you get the energy uh, density two point function. And uh, this pole is just uh, canceled uh, by a factor in the in the residue. So in the end, you, uh, you, don't, you, you don't get this pole and you don't get the exponential growth, just you get the usual thermal two point function of stress energy into the CFTs. OK. Uh, so, so these examples uh, where this actually works uh, all have maximal chaos. Uh, and the question is, is there a pole skipping phenomenon when there's no maximal chaos? And if yes, what's the generalization? And there's already a hint uh, from the previous slide because 2D CFTs are not always maximally chaotic, but their thermal two-point function is fixed by symmetry. So the thermal two-point function always just shows pole skipping uh, at the values corresponding to maximal chaos. So the answer is that there is a pole skipping phenomenon, or the expectation from this example is that there is a pole skipping phenomenon away from maximal chaos, and that the generalization is, is not this formula, but instead you need to kind of modify these, these parameters in a certain way. And based on what I told you about uh, this velocity dependent Yapunov exponent, uh, the natural way to, to generalize this formula is that to always pick this data to be the stress tensor contribution to chaos, or like the contributions that you have at the edge of the butterfly uh, cone where, where you saturate this chaos bound. So this is always two pi over beta, and then there's some stress tensor butterfly speed appearing here. And indeed, in 2D CFTs, this is always one. So, so that's why it is consistent with, uh, uh, with the 2D CFT answer that is universal. Uh, OK, so this is a kind of anti-climatic proposal because you cannot really read this chaos data from the stress energy two-point function, which would be surprising anyways. Uh, but on the other hand, in many systems, you, you, you can actually, if this is true, uh, read the butterfly speed. So if you do have a critical velocity, then the butterfly speed, the physical butterfly speed, is the same as this stress tensor butterfly speed. OK, uh, so now let me give non-trivial. So this is a conjecture. Uh, and I showed, like I, I told you one example where it works. So, so now I will uh, give you another example where it works, uh, which is way less trivial because the answer is not fixed by symmetry, but completely dynamical. Uh, and this example is uh, the energy correlator in this SYK chain that I, I have been talking about. So again, we have this kind of atoms of SYK models, uh, and there's a Hamiltonian. It's a sum over lattice points of some energy density. 
uh, and we pick the energy density in, in this way. Uh, so there is because it's a lattice model, there's some ambiguity, but but this uh, will be the uh, the proper way of doing it. So there's nothing uh, particularly interesting here. There's like uh, an on-site term, and then there's nearest neighbor terms, and we pick it so that it's symmetrized, uh, so that it involves equal to the left and to the right contributions. Sorry, sorry Gabor, can I ask a question about the previous slide? Yes. Understand. So, so I mean, the, is the um, claim that means you you cannot find uh, uh, this lambda l as a function of v from pole skipping or so? so uh, yeah, yeah, you cannot. It... You certainly cannot do that. You can also not find the the exponent this value here, which is the true Yaponov exponent. That but uh, what appears instead is the, this lambda t, which is just this value here, like two pi over beta. Right, but uh, there is no there is no setup. Uh, uh, there is no pole skipping associated with uh, lambda l v. Not necessarily stress tensor, but uh, means my my question is can 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 um, means for this generalized velocity dependent Lyapunov that you have. Is there mm -hmm. any pole skipping associated with that particular Lyapunov? Um, with this one, no, there isn't. Yeah, but but so it, this would be very all, surprising. Yeah, yeah. It, it it is always stress tensor correlator uh, that one is looking at because of the hydro uh, reason. But uh, yeah. are there any other means can means can pole skipping? Uh, this generalized pole skipping take place in any other kind of uh, conserved uh, current or i see i see yeah so we haven't uh, really looked at it but uh, i would say that uh, there will be uh, yeah so so i think there there were some other papers uh, at least in the holography context like checking pole skipping in current current correlators. Uh, and I forget the results, but in that case, you, you do have some pole skipping with some, some canonical data in it. Uh, in this case, uh, I just, in general, expect some kind of pole skipping to happen because it seems quite generic, but uh, I'm not sure whether it's uh, related to any uh, chaos. Chaos, chaos data or other type of uh, data. Yeah. Nothing from the nothing from the Rege, uh, Rege kind of uh, there is no pole, pole skip connection with pole skipping and the Rege uh, uh, connections with the Rege limits. Or... Yeah, not 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 really. Yeah, so it seems like that this um, yeah so this region is kind of a non-local object. It's like a collective excitation. It doesn't give you some sharp pole in. Uh, yeah. yeah, so and, and we also don't know how to think about like a region two point function. So it's not a local two point but, function. But, local but, but somehow, but somehow in, in the in, in the Rege uh, discussion also the uh, leading behavior was coming from this uh, uh, twist uh, the, the stress tensor pole. Yeah, um, above the critical velocity. Above, yes. above the critical velocity. Yeah. And here yeah, so that, that's that. how this picture is essentially. Yeah, so in, in conformal Reggie theory, you have four operators and they exchange basically in this limit what they exchange, they exchange a whole on OP, but in this limit, they exchange like a single collective excitation that involves just the leading Reggie trajectory. So this is what you yeah. could call a region. Or, yeah. uh, and then when you tune this kind of uh, velocity to be above the critical velocity, what happens in this contour integral is that you Becomes... You you repick just the stress tensor contribution, and then what dominates this is just like the stress ten, stress energy tensor exchange. So it's really like this uh, this picture of uh, of just and, having and, like but, a but, but it is again the stress tensor pole skipping that gives this uh, maximal lambda. Yeah, yeah. So what, what means one maybe after the region pole skipping if there is some. Uh, no generalization yeah. of that concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if uh, if you would have some sort of region two point function, it might display some pole skipping related to to the actual Yaponov exponent. Yeah. Though it, it's not totally sure 
though that the pole would be skipped because there's no like as for the stress energy retard at two point function for this region two point function or whatever it would be there's like all bets are off like what it can do and what what it cannot um, <clears throat> okay uh so we want to calculate this uh, this two point function of uh, of this energy density operator and, and this is some ambitious task because we are doing it in a thermal chaotic lattice system uh, but in any ways we will uh, succeed uh, so this is now euclidean uh, two point function so remember poskeping was about the retarded one but we will be interested in frequency space and the the these Matsubara amplitudes uh, that describe this guy in frequency space, they are the ones that are related to uh, the retarded correlator via simple analytic continuation in frequency. Okay. Uh, so the idea to obtain this, uh, this correlation function is the following. So I will just sketch the idea. So, so we start with the four point function, the fermion four point function, uh, and we obtain it in the following way. So the idea is that uh, because these epsilons are all like fermion to a power Q and you have this anti-commutation relation, uh, you have the following relation. So if you take commutator of uh, fermion with H, so this guy acts as a derivative. So it being, brings down, becomes like chi to the Q minus one and then you multiply it back with the chi and you sum back the I. And essentially what you get if you work out the factors is that uh, this is Q times uh, the energy density. Uh, okay, so why is this useful? Because now you can look at this four point function here. Uh, this just for the fermions. And you can take a derivative with respect to this time and this time. So tau one and tau three. So, so what does the derivative do to Heisenberg operators? It just brings down a commutator like this. So now when you send uh, this time to each other, so it's like an OP like limit, tau one goes to tau two and tau three goes to tau four then you get two copies of this formula uh, separated by a time translation. So this pres prescription is kind of an OP type prescription. It gives you, it gives you this energy energy correlator. Okay, so why is this useful? It's useful because we had a formula for this four point function in terms of these, uh, these ladder kernels, uh, as I mentioned a few slides ago. Okay, so, so now you can just turn the crank and calculate this, and it turns out that you can calculate the Matsubara amplitudes, and then uh, you can also find the analytic continuation that gives you the retarded correlator, uh, and it looks like this. So this is uh, looks pretty complicated, so sorry about it. There's nothing in particular that you should see in this formula, but, uh, but the reason I'm showing it is that it exists as, a, as an analytic, a completely analytic expression, which is a quite a remarkable fact uh, just in itself, because uh, to our knowledge, this is essentially the only known uh, exact non-perturbative thermal correlator that is not fixed by symmetry and changes in a totally non-trivial way as you tune a coupling between zero and some maximal value. Um, okay. Uh, so we have this formula, this is nice, and then you can check, uh, because it's a total analytic formula, you can check whether uh, it displays pole skipping and how it displays it. So now you can plot this uh, formula as function of imaginary frequency uh, and imaginary momentum, and then you will have some zero lines and some pole lines. So the lower half plane, you, you have various structures, but on the upper half plane, you only have this kind of diffusion Pole. So it starts from zero uh, momentum and frequency and starts quadratically. And then there's also a zero line. And the zero line indeed crosses the pole line and it crosses it at the values uh, that are predicted by this uh, modified pole skipping. Uh, and if you remember, I have shown you a formula about uh, stress tensor butterfly speed. And in this model, it's like a totally non trivial function of the couplings. Uh, as opposed to uh, like a 2D CFT where it's just one. So here it really depends on both of the couplings in a very non-trivial way. Uh, and it's still true that this location for all values of the coupling uh, happens. Uh, 
to be the pole skipping location. Okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, the other comment is that there are many pole skipping points also on the lower half plane, but because they give you kind of, they would give you kind of decaying contribution, uh, these are not related to chaos, but they're still potentially interesting for other purposes. Okay, so so this was about pole skipping, and let me just now like make uh, just some quick comments about this uh, energy correlation function because uh, you can study various other things than post skipping once you have this formula. Uh, so one interesting phenomenon that it displays is, uh, is if you just look at this diffusive dispersion relation. So now at real momenta and imaginary frequency, this is this is the diffu diffusion pole. So this is for this value of the coupling. This is for another value of the coupling. So this is the regime that is described by hydro away from it, uh, it gives new predictions. Uh, and you can see that uh, for some smaller coupling, this uh, diffusion pole can kind of reach the edge of the Brillouin zone, uh, but uh, there's kind of a level crossing and rejoining uh, uh, happening at some coupling. So this is some totally non-perturbative phenomenon where uh, the diffusion pole re uh, rejoins with a gap pole and then then you have uh, this kind of thing so this is also related to uh, by many other works uh, to uh, convergence uh, of all order hydro and so on uh, so this is kind of the kind of phenomenon that makes hydro not converge uh, <clears throat> okay so so let me just summarize uh, so in this SYK chain, uh, we calculated this uh, retarded correlator exactly as a function of the couplings, uh, which is a kind of a unique uh, formula with uh, very interesting analytic properties. Uh, and it also confirms uh, this modified pole skipping conjecture in a highly non-trivial way. Uh, OK, and here I will just leave this little butterfly cone as uh, as the summary of my talk. And thanks a lot for listening. Uh, thank you, Gabor, for your nice contribution. And uh, it's a very elaborative and clear talk. And I am hopeful once I will upload it in YouTube, people can contact you and ask you more questions. Yeah, like it will be very helpful for everyone. Uh, yeah, before saying anything, Bittarko, given a clap. So I used to say that if uh, like after talk, all of the listeners should give a clap for the speaker. So that's that's very nice. If the Tarko have any specific question, please ask. Uh, no, the, thank you actually. Very, uh, it's a very nice lot. talk, I have thank to say, you. yeah. So, Diptarko, are you in home? Yeah, I'm in Kanpur, in, uh, in the institute. It's it's IIT Kanpur? Yes, yes. Oh, OK. OK, so Gabor, you, you uh, can go thanks on. for your contribution. And yeah. once it will be uploaded, I will share in uh, the link with you. And other people like Diptarko, everybody knows the channel, so he, he can get back to the uh, channel and see the contribution again and uh, thanks again and stay safe and healthy that's important and uh, yeah, you hope too. to see you again with some of your new work and ideas very soon yeah, thanks a lot yeah.